about sound.
chat room if the sound is okay. Stop the show and start it over again. I've had two people say it's starting and stopping. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. 
Third or Sabbath, it's always a portrait of a presentation. <laughs> it's always a portrait of a presentation. And as you can see, we've got a pile of snakes in the front. Um, <laughs> Uh, where we where we've got our stuff but we are happy to be here in portrait or landscape mode happy sabbath to you that's um, how the sound is how's the sound doing now we had a little trouble to start uh, but it is all better now i hope uh, we've heard a few people say it's better um let's see so mimi some people are in the um, YouTube chat room. We always talk about Facebook first, so let's talk about YouTube tonight. We have someone called Fresh Mana Music Ministries. Greetings. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen that name in the chat room. Of course, we've got Mimi there, and um, I'm sure Carl's there. Uh, Carl posted the link to YouTube on Facebook, so if you want to port over to YouTube or double dip and do both, uh, you can do that now. Okay, let's right, do this. Are we ready to get started? And we're blurry again. Um, uh, I, it's clear here. I think some of it might be your oh, iPad. Okay. Might be my iPad. Okay. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to our 78th show. I'll start our set with 78. I can't believe it. 78. Okay. We're so glad to be with you tonight. We love it that the internet can be used for such good uh, things for God's people. Beginning the Sabbath, for example, together electronically. i got to stop hitting the table and yeah. picking up your habits. That's right. That's right. Computers have misused. Uh, uh, computers have been misused for thousands of years. So tonight, let's use them for good. Right. Well, no way. Did Did you say computers have mis been misused for thousands of years? That's what I said. Uh, no, no. That the personal computer has only been around since like 1980. Uh, that's where you're wrong. The computer goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I know I'm going to be sorry for asking you this, but how can you say that computers go back to the Garden of Eden? Well, the Bible tells us. Remember when Adam and Eve had an apple? Yeah. Uh, how do you like that? Let's yeah. move on. All right. But there was a problem because they had extremely limited memory back then. Okay. Am I right or wrong on that? Come no on. No more, please. And, and they had, and they just had one bite, B-Y-T-E. Get it? Bite? All right. No. All right. Are you finished? And, and then everything crashed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what the Bible says. You say potato, I say potato. We have a show to do. You say tomato, I say tomato. All right, we're so glad you're here with us this yeah. evening. Yes, <laughs> all through the week, we look forward to being with you on Start Our Sabbath. So thank you so much for spending your Friday evenings with us. Thank you. Oh, once again, we've got to extend our gratitude to Carl and Mimi for all their hard work that they do to get this show on the air. We also want to thank Carl for his labors as webmaster for our two websites, the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association and Dynamic Christian Ministries. Yeah, Carl really knows his computer stuff. So please tell Carl in the chat room how smart he is and what a great job he does on this show and also at rldea.com as well as dynamicchristianministries.org. And our thanks go out to his sidekick, Mimi, who's in her new apartment in British Columbia. And she's a ginger now. We need an updated picture. Yeah, we need a ginger photo, don't we? All yeah. right. And uh, running the board up in California is the wonderful Terry Lucenhide. Terry is connecting Bill to the show, something poor Bill wouldn't be able to figure out in a million years. So it's a good thing he has Terry. Yeah, we tell Bill all the time how blessed he is to have a wife like Terry. Does anyone ever say that about me? Oh, they don't have to because I say it about you all the time. <laughs> I would be up a crick without a paddle, without Nancy. A crick? I'm glad that's settled. Let's open with prayer. That's the southern pronunciation. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you and we are so blessed by you. We thank you for the blessings that you just shower down upon us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ who died for our sins so that we might have eternal life. We thank you so much for your generosity where we can get our computers out and get together and talk and be together on the Sabbath. This is a wonderful opportunity, and we thank you, Father, for that. Now, please be with us during the show. Uh, we put a, a lot of work into it during the week, and we ask you to bless that work, and we ask you to bless the technical stuff that really bothers us sometimes. So, Father, please be with us as we all fellowship in Christian love your called out ones, your obedient ones. We give you praise and thanks, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thinking of Speaking of thanks, I wanted to mention thanks for two things. One, we think we might be close to solving some of our technical issues, and no. I'll tell you how. Don't get, get their hopes up. up. Don't get their hopes we, up. I said we think we might be close. 
So uh, continue praying for that. And also, I just wanted to say a thanks to the brethren at uh, CGI in Oklahoma City last oh. week. We had a great time with them. They provided some great food, and we just enjoyed our time with them. Uh, Wes gave the sermon. He gave some special music. We had that great fellowship where there was a QA, and a and we just... We just enjoyed them very, very much. So it was nice. I think we're going to get to go back again in the spring holidays. Yeah, for the uh, first holiday, we think. We think. Okay. Lord yeah. willing, and the crypts don't. Yeah, and um, we it's not set in stone. Yeah, Cecil Green is the pastor up there. He's a wonderful guy. I've known him from the 70s. We've talked about this before. And I was kind of surprised because during the potluck, Cecil says, um, hey, let's have a Q&A. <laughs> he don't know just threw what, you under the bus on he, that He just one. threw me under the bus. It was totally impromptu. But... I don't think we've done a Q&A since I used to preach over at CEM. Uh -huh. Remember at CEM, what we do is give a sermon, uh -huh. take a 10 minute break, get a snack and come back and sit in a circle and take questions and answers from the audience there and then the audience on the mm -hmm. um, internet. Mm -hmm. So it's my, I think that was the first time I've done Q&A in years and years, but yeah. it was great. I, I love Q&A, not because I'm so smart, but because I always start a Q&A by saying, I don't know everything, so you're going to get a lot of I don't know because mm -hmm. I don't have perfect knowledge. Okay. So anyway, thank you, Cecil Green and the Oklahoma City CGI. And that's right. We hope we get to go back. Yes, Now, we we've got a great show for you tonight right here. So let's talk in the present. Bill's going to talk about whether or not all animals are fit for human consumption. And I understand he has uh, someone else on stage with him tonight. Yes, a special guest. Okay. And Nancy's going to talk about Nazca lines. You know, those huge images that were carved into the ground, like almost 2,000 years ago by the people of ancient Peru. That's right. And what was supposed to talk about judging, like is judging something a Christian should refrain from, or is judging something we have carte blanche to do as much of as we want? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I was going <laughs> to do that. Had a major glitch in my Word files this week, and frankly, I lost my portion of the script. So I'm going to have to rebuild the whole presentation on uh, judging from uh, scratch. Boy, you talk about a heartbreaker. That one broke my heart. But I promise, next Friday evening, God willing, we will do that one uh, on our next show. We're going to talk about Christians and religious matters, Christians and judgment involving leaders and things like that. So um, come back next week. We're going to go through that uh, next week. I've got some a little something else this week that we put together. But I won't be there. No. But we're going to talk about uh, uh, secular leaders next week when it comes right. to judgment. Interesting. I take it that some of the content was uh, prompted by the funeral of George H.W. Bush this week? Uh, that's right. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. There, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the life of the late President Bush. And there are lessons we can learn from guys like the late President Johnson. We're going to talk about these guys. We're also going to talk about when we should judge, when we shouldn't. Um, you don't want to miss that show. We look forward to that. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, I got to mention that something that just hit my news feed uh, before the show, okay? And I'm going to put this picture on the screen. There is a mm -hmm. controversy out there going on, and I just found out about a little while ago. I think it's been going on for a day or two. I just found out about it just before the show, and I hurried up and uh, changed the script. It's going on right now regarding an incident that took place last week when President Trump attended the funeral of
tell you, on this particular issue, I'm with Trump. First of all, I am, ne two points. First of all, I am never going to say the Apostles' Creed. Second of all, I'm not, I'm not going to get all over someone else who does or doesn't recite the Apostles' Creed. Come on. Reciting the Apostles' Creed is an act of worship. And every person has a right to worship as he or she sees fit. How I worship is none of your business. How some, how some person out there worships, it's none of your business. How Trump worships is none of anybody's business. Now, I know that someone's going to get offended by this. Someone's going to say, Wes, why won't you even say the Apostles' Creed? That's terrible that you won't say the Apostles' Creed. All right, let's talk about that. Let's give an answer. I agree with most of the Apostles' Creed, most of it, but not all of it. And here are the parts of the Apostles' Creed that I take exception to. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, the whole creed. You can go online and read it. It's all over on the Internet. I'm only going to mention the things I disagree with because I agree with most of it. Here's the stuff I don't agree with. First thing, it says this. I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, period. And then it moves on to another subject. My problem with this line is that it says that only the Father was the creator of heaven and earth. And on this show, on previous shows, we've talked about this issue. How we believe the scriptures show that it was both the Father and the Son who were present at creation. And, and we believe that's why it is said in Genesis, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image. There's plural, plurality here. No singularity as the Apostles' Creed says. All right, that's one sentence. How about this sentence? I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. No way am I going to say that line. Now I know, I know. When it uses the word Catholic in the Apostles' Creed, it doesn't necessarily mean the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic in here is not capitalized. It simply means universal. It means the church throughout the world. And no one preaches the concept about how the church is all over the world and it's in every nation and that it's not confined to the organization. No one preaches that more than I do. I mean, I'm always preaching that. I say how the church is not to be subservient to one nation or to one organization. I'm a big proponent of that. You know, you know that. I'm always admonishing Sabbath keepers to be really, really careful when they say things like, Sunday keepers are not part of the true church. Now, I'm not saying they are, but I'm sure not going to say that they aren't. I just say, let's be really, really careful. So I get this whole thing about what they're saying in this definition of the word Catholic in the Apostles' Creed. Now, if they ever came up with a word other than Catholic, let's talk about it more. But in the meantime, as long as they use that unfortunate term, Catholic, I'm not going to say the Apostles' Creed. All right, one more line that I don't like. It says, I believe in the communion of the saints. Now, there's more to this than, than you read there, because if you go into Catholic teachings, Episcopalian, Orthodox, and all these churches, Presbyterian, that, that believe in the Apostles' Creed, when you ask them about this, what I've learned is that this line many times means that we can do two things. We can pray for the saints that are dead, and we can pray to saints who are dead. Now, I don't believe in either one of those. All right, one final thought. I am not pro-Trump, not anti-Trump, but I feel the need to mention something that I think is kind of related to all this. I confess that I didn't like something that Trump said several times during his campaign when he was running for president. A couple times he complained that people won't say Merry Christmas. That includes me. I, I won't say Merry Christmas. Not going to do it. And, and, and this includes a lot of you out there. You won't say Merry Christmas. Some of you out there will. Some won't. In 2015, in Springfield, Illinois, Trump said, he was talking about Starbucks because he didn't like that they weren't, you know, demonstrating love for Christmas properly. And he said, maybe we should boycott Starbucks. I don't know. Then he said, if I become president, 
we're all going to be saying Merry Christmas again. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. That is a direct quote. In the same way that I say that folks should back off on how Trump worships, I say to Trump and anyone else who doesn't like that I won't say Merry Christmas, I say, back off. I say, mind your own business. How I worship is my affair and my affair alone. Now, my hope is that everyone involved in this Apostles' Creed controversy will all just stop and take a deep breath. Let's not be getting all over other people who don't believe what you believe, those who don't worship the way that you worship. Let's disagree with each other, but we've got to disagree with each other, but that doesn't mean we've got to get mad and say, well, you're wrong and you need to do this and just get all over each other. With that last thought, I can't think of a better way to segue into next week's show where I'm going to talk about this very thing, judgments. That's what we're going to talk about. All right, let's take a quick commercial break. And we'll see you on the other side in 30 seconds. When Jesus and his disciples plucked and ate grain on the Sabbath day, they raised the ire of the Pharisees who accused them of breaking God's law. The questions of what actions break God's law and what actions don't break God's law is something that we have to deal with regularly. For example, we like to ask the question, when is something a violation of the Seventh-day Sabbath? And when is something not a violation of the Seventh-day Sabbath? So much of this goes back to defining the word work. And sometimes it's really hard to draw clear lines on these issues. At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a message that explains so much regarding this subject. In this sermon, Ron Dart talks about Jesus' approach to the Sabbath. Ron contrasts the differences between Jesus' logic and the logic of the Pharisees. Ron explains that any approach that differs from that of Jesus' approach is half-brain religion. So the title of this message is Half-Brain Religion. You can find it on the audio recordings tab on our website, rldea.com. This message is free. Again, the title is Half Brain Religion at rldea.com. Thank you, Gary Gibbons, for those beautiful words. Um, I, but before we get going, um, I want to reiterate what Nancy alluded to earlier, which was we're trying to work out something to get all this technical stuff fixed once and for all. So we're going to ask for your prayers. If you've got a prayer list, which we encourage you to always mm -hmm. have, please write that down on the prayer list that we're able to fix this uh, uh, technical stuff. We think we've got a solution. We think we're almost there. So um, uh, please pray about it. All right. Now, before the show tonight, Nancy and I were discussing something, and I want to finish that conversation before we you, before you go into your next Some segment. Some other time, please. You know, we've got a show to do. No, I want to get this off my chest. I don't get it. Get this. There was no way to lock it. Please, no. And even if they did have a lock, anybody could just duck down and sneak in anyway. Do we have to do this? And in the winter, everyone inside would freeze to death. Even the drinks would freeze. Wes, we really need to discuss this later. Why those saloons in the Old West had those swinging doors. All right, but don't forget. I want to discuss You got that. it. Okay. Uh, and uh, now that we've got it and we're going to get it settled, what have you got for us tonight, Nancy? Well, I'm going to talk about the Nazca lines um, as soon as I get my wheel going and start my segment right here. Okay. All right. Um, almost 2,000 years ago, a people in South America created some astonishing art. They were the Nazca people of Peru, and they drew several hundred animals and human figures in the dirt. That is, they carved their artwork into the earth. And these figures are huge. Now, believe it or not, this project is still down there. If you jump on a plane, you can look at it from the sky. You can see it while standing next to it, of course, but you can see it more impressively from the sky. Now, how big is this project? I'm not making this up. The totality of this artwork encompasses nearly 170 square miles. Of the many figures in it, some of the largest can span nearly 1,200 feet. That's four football fields! Some of the figures in the effort include a hummingbird, which is uh, like 310 feet long, a condor which, it, condor, which is 440 feet long, a monkey, 
which measures, measures 310 feet by 190 feet, and a spider, which is 150 feet long. Now, why is it this, this artwork has been preserved for so well over more than a millennium? Well, the extremely dry and windless climate of the Nazca region is, has preserved these lines very well. It's a desert, so um, it's an area which is one of the driest of the earth. This environment maintains a temperature nearly 77 degrees Fahrenheit year round. The lack of wind has helped keep the lines uncovered and visible. Also, the fact that the sublayer of soil was lime, which hardened by their exposing it to the elements, helped to preserve the images for all this time. Archaeologists claim that these were created between 500 BC and 500 AD, so a long time ago. All right, that's what we know. Now let's get to, into what we don't know. Scientists and histor historians continue to try to figure out why the Nazca's created all these drawings. What was their purpose? Many hours of TV and many pages of books have been devoted to the motive behind these artworks. Also, TV shows like Ancient Aliens and books like Chariots of the Gods have proposed that aliens either created these things or helped the Nazca people create these carvings in the soil. In previous shows, we've talked about how evolutionists would have us believe that humanity is constantly evolving steadily for the better. That is, mankind gets smarter and stronger and healthier as each century passes. But we know that's not true. We say this because many accomplishments that were in ancient times, that were done in ancient times, either cannot be duplicated today or there were ancient accomplishments that can only be reproduced by mankind in the last 100 or 200 years because of our access to huge machinery, which they didn't have back then. The Nazca carvings into the earth aren't the only example of this. Here are some other wonders of the world uh, um, that were created by ancient man, wonders that are either, you know, could not be accomplished today or can only be accomplished, say, in the last 100 years. Stonehenge, a prehistoric monument in Wiltshire, England. It consists of a ring of standing stones with each standing stone around 13 feet high by 7 feet wide and weighing around 25 tons. Archaeologists believe it was constructed from 3000 BC to 2000 BC. Now that's one. The Great Wall of China is another one. Several sections of it are, were being built as early as the 7th century BC. These, later joined together by other uh, parts of the wall and made bigger and stronger are collectively referred to as the Great Wall of China. Especially famous is a section of the wall built in 220 to 206 BC by uh, Queen Shai Hang, the first emperor in China. The Great Pyramid of Giza, that's another one. The Great Pyramid was the tallest man-made structure in the world for more than 3,800 years. The Egyptians of 2000 BC t seemed to have used higher math and had a grasp of physics and architectural rules in order to build those pyramids. You, you may also recall that the Egyptians had a method of embalming that preserved bodies for centuries, a method we cannot even replicate today. The Bible itself talks about man's ability to build structures of impressive height, like the Tower of Babel, which we read about in Genesis 11. The Bible, all the way back in Genesis 3, references man's skill in creating and playing musical instruments as well as skill in metalwork and jewelry making. If we were to drop into a major city of the Roman Empire, we would find bathing was a frequent We'd be appalled by the filthy way people lived, the illiteracy of the masses, and probably how much they stunk, even the so-called aristocracy. Refuse was dumped into the streets. There was no indoor plumbing. People were overwhelmingly infested with lice and other vermin. Only the aristocracy and clergy were literate. In my opinion, it is false to accept the claim that the Nazca people did not have the mathematical ability, the tools, or the vision to create these structures. Yet that is what the assumption is. Many believe the Nazca people were not as evolved as you and I are today. 
The book in the movie named Hidden Figures tells how a group of women during the early days of American space exploration were known as computers. Yeah, they were actually called computers because they made advanced, advanced mathematical calculations on chalkboards or with pencil and paper. These women were able to successfully calculate the trajectory of our early space travels in the years before the mechanical computers came into usage. My point in bringing this up is that the human mind is capable of computer-like calculations. We just don't need it now because we got computers. <coughs> Let's get back to the Nazcas. How they made these drawings and why they made these drawings. Here are some theories about the how. Theory number one. The Nazca people emigrated to South America from the area in the Middle East where we Christians believe all life began. This theory states that the Nazcas had the same type of education and skills the ancient Egyptians, Chinese, and Romans, and the people who built Stonehenge had, and that skill was lost over time. As Christians, we know that God did not create mankind as mentally inferior, animal-like beings. We were created in God's image with great capacity to gain knowledge and skill. Further, we know that God gave mankind laws for living, that, for living our lives that would have kept mankind on a path of education, creativity, and skill had mankind continued to value God's law and a relationship with him. But that is not what happened. Instead, mankind rejected God's laws in favor of human reasoning and human -made value, man made values. We saw this in history. We see it today. As a result of mankind's rejection of God's law, we find mankind regressing, not only in obedience to God, but also in basic tenets of education, hygiene, and so much more. An example of how godlessness can set a nation or a civilization backward in North Korea. It is North Korea. I recently read a book about the conditions there. Even in the late 20th century, this godless nation had its people still building dams with manual labor, you know, shovels and people hauling stuff up a hill uh, on their backs. From a Christian point of view, we don't have to rely on an assumption that some alien life came to Earth to help the Nazca people. We know that man's journey through the ages has been not been a straight and steady path to ever-increasing education and development. Man's journey from creation to today has been one of peaks and valleys. Peaks that involve good times where education, industry, medicine, mathematics, and science made life better. And valleys where a, a dissension into depravity, squalor, ignorance, and disease occurred. Very often, this is a result of war. Even today, a prosperous nation can find itself struggling with famine and disease as a byproduct of war. War breaks down the social structure in a country and damages the landscape. It's obvious that the Nazca people once had the tools and skills to create these images, but somewhere along the line in their history, they lost these tools and skills. Again, what causes a people to lose these things? War and its companions, famine and disease. It's as though the Nazca descended into their own dark ages, much like Europe did. And all the education, abilities, and history were forgotten in a focus on surviving in the aftermath of conflict. It's quite possible they were overrun by a more powerful people, which were more inclined to learn the skills of war than math and science and engineering. Bottom line is that we have no reason to believe these people were less skilled or less intelligent as the people who built Stonehenge or the pyramids. That's theory number one. They could do it themselves. Theory number two is that they had outside help. What if a non-human being gave the Nazca people help or instructions? And this falls into two categories. The first one is aliens. Could it have been alien beings from another planet? Is this idea at odds with Christianity? In my opinion, absolutely not. In fact, I believe that Christianity is much more aligned to this idea than is the theory of evolution. Uh, please bear with me while I outline how this can be so. If you believe that God created everything, man, beast, and flora on the earth, you have to acknowledge that he could replicate that effort, that effort in other galaxies. An all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, loving creator God who created mankind on earth for the express purpose of spending eternity with the children he created would have no trouble repeating his successful creation somewhere else. I believe Christians should be able to accept the concept um, uh, that, that uh, God might want to create um, life on other parts, uh, in other parts of the universe. 
So we have no proof of alien life, but the idea of it, the possibility of it, is not contrary to Christian faith. In fact, as I said, in my opinion, the idea that our Heavenly Father God created life on other planets is entirely more probable than that the Big Bang worked in more than one galaxy. For this same idea that viable humanoid life exists in other galaxies, to be accepted by believers in evolution, would they, they, they would have to accept one of two theories. Either one, that one, one Big Bang resulted in a replicated, highly specific succession of DNA twists and turns from primordial soup to complex humanoid beings or complex non-humanoid beings somewhere else in the universe, that's one, or two, that there was a second Big Bang with the same or similar results in some other uh, part um, out there in the vast universe. But what are the odds on that? The odds would have to be astronomical because the odds of the process from primordial soup to human beings right here on the earth are steep at each and every evolutionary step along the path of evolutionary development. And that's what evolution says itself, what the odds are. But the fact remains that even though we have no proof of extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial human life form, either superior or inferior to the humans of planet Earth, it is possible. In my opinion, it isn't likely, but it is possible. So if it's not aliens, the second idea is that it could have been spirit beings, angels, or even Jesus himself. What if it were angels or the Lord himself who gave the Nazca people tools, calculations, and inspiration for the Im these images? Is that possible? It's possible. Angels visited man many times. It's recorded in the Bible. Angels visited Hagar, Genesis 16:7. Abraham, Genesis 22:15. Jacob, Genesis 31:11. Moses, Exodus 2. Elijah, Exodus 3:2. Exodus 3:2. Thank mm -hmm. you. Elijah, 1 Kings 19:5-8. Joseph, Matthew 1:2. Mary, Luke 1:26-38. That's just to name a few. God Himself gave Noah the instructions for building the ark. Find that in Genesis 6. Moses received both the Ten Commandments and the instructions for building the tabernacle directly from God at a meeting on a mountaintop. I don't think we can emphatically assume that direct contact with angels or the Lord himself is confined to what's been recorded in the Bible. There could be non-biblical incidents that have happened during the history of man that just weren't written down anywhere. And yes, it is a plausible theory that the Nazca people had help from the spiritual realm, either angels or God himself, or Jesus. So far... I focused on the how of the Nazca peoples um, in an effort to show that it's entirely possible that these people had the ability to craft these structures with or without third-party intervention. But let's get back to the why. Why would the Nazcas create something that they knew could only be seen fully from high above the earth? They didn't have airplanes. Nearly every culture across the globe and throughout history has believed in a higher power, a god or gods in the heavens, and they've all built structures to worship and honor these beings. We have no idea what was in the minds of the people who created the Nazca lines in southern Peru. They left us no written explanation. We can only guess uh, that this work was a labor of love, an act of honor or worship, perhaps created in the hopes of bringing a smile to a face of those in the heavens for whom the message was intended. Perhaps they were drawing what they thought their gods looked like. Or perhaps they were in, these drawings were intended to present the being they worship with the likeness of his creation. Like a child drawing a stick figure family portrait to present to their parent. Now let's be really clear. All that I have covered so far about the how and the why of the Nazca lines is nothing more than guesswork. And we have covered some plausible theories, I believe. And if you've got another one, please write one in the chat room. Tell us what your theory is. Mm -hmm. Someone, um, when I posted it earlier, someone mentioned uh, Nephilim. Yes, they did. <clears throat> and come on. So let's not take this stuff too seriously. Don't you find it in interesting to consider these things and fun to discuss them? I sure do. Shouldn't be any fights over this. It's all conjecture. And here's an important point that I want to get out of this whole thing, having nothing to do with the how or why. Whatever the motive or whatever the process of the Nazca people, they built something, a series of things, that stood the test of time. Their work is still here after hundreds of years of rains, floods, drought, and more. They left a legacy 
that people are interested in. What about us? What are we building? How are we building? What legacy will I leave behind? Let me leave you with a couple of lessons I think we can learn from the Nazca people in these Nazca lines. Number one, build on the rock. Luke 6, 47 tells us, As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. Verse 48, They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house but could not shake it because it was well, well built. 49, But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on a ground without foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So that's number one. Build on the rock. Number two, build with the best materials. 1 Corinthians 3.12 tells us, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, verse 13, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. 15. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. If we do these two things, build on the rock and build with enduring materials, then our own lives can be like the Nazca line. Structures to be admired from the heaven, heavens, images to honor God, works that stand the test of time. I welcome your thoughts, comments, and questions. And as always, you can write me in the chat room right here tonight or at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. Very good, sweetheart. Very, very good presentation. Um, I don't know if you know this out there, but um, sometimes we get uh, flack over uh, Nancy because um, she, uh, you know, is... Preaches. <laughs> you're not really preaching, you're talking about things. And a lot of people don't like that because you're a woman. And I'm just as proud as I can be of Nancy because she comes up with this good stuff and um, this makes me very happy. So mm -hmm. great job. Thank you, Thank sweetheart. You. Thank you. I'm going to go over and focus in on the commercial. Okay, do that. And also um, when I get Bill on here too. Oh, also uh, Nancy brought up some things that we discussed in a previous show. It was on SOS 45. It was about Nephilim giants. As Nancy pointed out, somebody mentioned that in the uh, chat room. So if you want to go back and watch SOS 45 about Nephilim Giants, you can do that. Maybe, uh, I don't know if it would be possible for us to put that in the chat room, the uh, link to it. And it goes into more detail. I think that's the one where we talk about what happens to a man when he rejects God and his laws. So, anyway, again, thank you, sweetheart. Uh, let's take a commercial break, and then uh, we're going to see if we can bring Bill on. We'll be right back. commercial by the great uh, Gary Gibbons. Thank you for that, Gary. Okay, at some point um, uh, on the show, I always want to remind you to check out the Facebook group called Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. Right now, it's up to like, I don't know where it is, 23, 24,000 followers. So if you're not part of Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers, you should be there. It's really good. It's put out by my good buddy, uh, Bill Lussenheit out in California. It's a great Facebook group, and uh, you're going to love it. Let's see if we can bring... Bring Bill on to uh, uh, giving mittens, uh, giving uh, kitten and puppies messages, so I'll try to give some a little more meat, okay? But uh, the cat does tie into what I'm trying to talk here uh, about tonight, 
And for those of you who don't know yet, the Bible does not condone the eating of cats. Do not eat your cat, all right? Not found in the Bible. And actually, you know the Bible does not condone the eating of lots of different things. Now, nearly everyone here in our audience tonight, uh, throughout the Sabbath-keeping community, do not eat unclean animals. And it's been a long-standing doctrine of our respective religious communities. I know that. But what I wanted to add here tonight, for all of our understanding, is that the commands against eating unclean foods were given both before Moses, after Moses, during the New Testament, after the resurrection, and yes, there's even something I'd like to call pork prophecy, all right, which tells us about the status of unclean foods yet future in the millennium in the kingdom of God. And so, in a way, we'll call this a bit of a study about the covenants and uh, when do they apply and how eternal they are and, and is God a God that changes not. And similar to this, the Sabbath command also predates Moses and it's enforced today also in the New Testament and indeed there is a prophetic element about the Sabbath as well that it will be kept also in the future. So let's dig in here a little bit. Now prior to Moses, uh, during the time of the flood, back in Genesis 7, we read uh, this. It says, The Lord said to Noah, Come unto the ark, you and all of your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of what? Every clean animal, a male and a female, two of each animals that are unclean, just a male and a female for the unclean animals, a male and a female. All right. So Noah was obviously very aware of what the concept of a clean and unclean animal was. This is well before Moses and at the time of the flood. And also, again, before Moses, likewise in Genesis, we read about the seven days of creation and that indeed God rested on the seventh day. This is not just something that came along in the Mosaic Covenant, all right, or at that time. It predates Moses. That's my point here. In Leviticus 11, of course, we see where Moses was instructed by God for all of Israel to eat, not eat all kinds of different manners of animals. And of course, uh, we have in, in, at that time, the Sabbath command was given to Moses with God's very own finger. God's very own finger on the clay tablets. All right. And so, again, I, I see these people try to debate all the time that, well, that was just for then, not for now. Well, you know, I don't know what gets more consistent than God wrecks it with his fingers and says to remember it when it comes to regards to the Sabbath. All right, listen up. Quiz time. Is a giraffe something we can eat? Is that a clean animal? Ponder that for a second. Giraffes, right? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. I haven't known anybody who's eaten a giraffe. But the answer is yes. The giraffe belongs to a family of grazing animals they have both a cloven hoof and they chew the cud, therefore making them consistent with kosher rules for eating. Isn't that interesting? Now, I've never known anybody's eaten a giraffe. But now, uh, of course, giraffes are, are actually kind of endangered, so I don't think it's a good idea to run out and get some, okay? So let's not do that, but very interestingly that you can eat giraffes. But what about the New Testament? Didn't all those unclean rules go out the window? And wasn't the Sabbath, you know, at the cross that was done away with? That's what some people will argue. Aren't those rules gone? Matthew 13, verse 47, I'd like to give your attention to. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, like a net, that's cast out into the sea and gathered some of every kind, a wide variety, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and they gathered the good into vessels, but they threw away the bad. Remember that, they, they separated this fish. Some were good and some were bad. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will, come, angels will come forth and separate the wicked from amongst the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. They threw away the bad fish. Now, if all food is clean, how can there be such a thing as a bad fish? And here's what's interesting. What is the original meaning of the word? 
The word for bad here is sepo, S-E-P-O, sepo, which means an unclean or corrupt or unusable animal. So that was a fresh catch. It wasn't like it was, it was spoiled or something. So they separated out the unclean and the kosher fish. Now, wouldn't that have been a great time for Jesus to instruct the disciples that it was okay to eat that stuff? Uh, wouldn't you agree that would, that would make sense that uh, Jesus would reiterate that this, he came along and do away with that kind of a thing? He had that opportunity, but he did not. All right. Later, after the cross, in fact, many years later, we have the event of Peter's vision in Acts 10, verse 9. Some people try to use this as a way to say that, well, now you can eat unclean foods. And verse 9 of uh, Acts 10, the next day as they went on their journey, they drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray. And about the sixth hour, he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet with four corners descend to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creepy things, birds of the air. And the voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And interesting how Peter responded to this. He said, No, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Again, this is after the cross. This is uh, quite some time after the cross. It was not Peter's custom to eat unclean animals. He had never had the idea in his mind that it was okay to do it. But then a voice spoke to him a second time and said, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times. And then the object was taken up into heaven again. Notice that Peter did, that said, Not so, Lord, I've not eaten anything common or unclean. So this was not a practical idea he had heard previously from Jesus. And notice he didn't eat anything at that time either. In fact, you can go the entire Bible from cover to cover. You will never find a righteous man of God eating an unclean meat. Immediately the next day, Peter was introduced to Cornelius, the Gentile. And what did Peter conclude from all this? Peter in verse 24 declares this. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or clean, unclean. All right? Any man that was the lesson of this. It wasn't that meat was all purified now. The lesson was that if God calls it clean, it is now clean. The Gentiles were called clean. That was the lesson of this. It had nothing to do with the, the ability for us to be able to eat unclean foods. And that was his complete conclusion. Not at all to be free to go out and run and buy some pork chops, okay? Now Hebrews 4.9, also you know, do, talking about the Sabbath, all right? <clears throat> it clearly informs us, again, in post-resurrection times, that therefore there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God to keep. That's the International Standard Version. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God to keep. All right. Again, that's far again after the time of the resurrection in the New Testament era, New Covenant era. The book of Revelation, which many regard as the last book of the New Testament to be composed, uh, maybe perhaps as late as 90 AD. And isn't it interesting that Babylon is referred to as the following almost at the very end of the book of Revelation in chapter 18, verse 2. Babylon is referred to as this in, in 18.2. She is a prison for every unclean spirit, a prison for every unclean bird and a prison for every unclean and hated beast. Why, again, if, if these animals were okay now, would John refer to these as unclean? In his mindset, these were still unclean animals. There was still such a thing, there was still such a class of creatures around as unclean, okay? And that's in the last book of the Bible, almost at the very end of the book, all right? Again, so this was not the mindset of the apostles during the first century church. If clean and unclean didn't exist, why was John recording it this late in the first century? It's certainly a worthy question to ask. I've never heard a good answer from someone who believes it's okay to be eating pork and other unclean animals. But lastly, let's talk about pork and unclean animals in the future. In Isaiah 66, it's prophetic, it's a prophetic setting. It's said about speaking about the time of the throne of Christ. Take a read it sometime of it. And you'll see it as a millennial setting. 
of Christ established in Zion for the millennium in, in its context. And what do we see in, in right in the middle of Isaiah 66 and verse 17? It says this, those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, that's at that time, eating swine flesh and the abomination and the mouse will be destroyed together, says the Lord. It's not going to be allowed in the kingdom of God. You will not be going and establishing idols. And you're not going to be allowed to be eating unclean foods. You will be destroyed. This is the word of God for the future. So we can see past uh, before Moses, during Moses, after the resurrection, in the future, no eating of unclean animals. It certainly would apply. There's no eating of unclean animals now. And we can conclude, conclude quite convincing that both past, present, and future, God has in place rules and a mindset also for the keeping of the Sabbath. God is infinite wisdom, knows what's good for us. And in just a few verses beyond uh, 66, 17 of Isaiah is verse 23. And it says this, yet future, from one Sabbath to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. That's both Jew, Jew Gentile, and everyone on, on the planet. All right, they will be keeping the Sabbath in the future. You know, God in his infinite wisdom, he knows what's good for us. And I've heard some argue, well, you know, with refrigeration and proper cooking, uh, pork's perfectly fine for us. That will be an argument some will make. And for the sake of argument, let's just assume that that's true. Let's just assume that uh, the, the meats can somehow, you know, be made uh, halfway healthy. But the eternal knows how the universe is put together. And he has these rules for our benefit, sometimes in ways we haven't even pondered. Did you realize that virtually all the flus that we have originate in China? And they come from pigs in China. Virtually every flu that we have. What happens is birds carry the virus from a flu. That's why they call it avian flu and different things. And then there's, they defecate in pig pens, which in turn gets consumed by the pigs. Pig organs and human organs are remarkably similar. So after the pig consumes this virus from the birds in the pig pen, the flu virus transmogrifies itself into being able to be communicable to humans. So flu comes from birds to pigs to humans. And pigs and humans, if they're in close proximity to one another, which happens if you're hurting them, if you're having pig pens on your farm and whatnot, uh, you can get transmission of the flu to human beings. Pigs and humans were not designed by God to have close quarters to one another for that very reason. Pig flu is one Chinese export, right, that we can do without. We don't want it. Let's put a major tariff on that. But do you realize that each year, upwards to one million people die from the flu? It is a, a major cause of death in the world. During, after a, the end of World War I, there was what's called the Spanish flu. And some 50 million people died from that influenza outbreak. And again, if we were not cohabitating with pigs, and to eat pigs, you have to be cohabitating with pigs, right? You would not have this scourge of flu. So regardless whether meat, you think the meat's good or not good, it is not good for man to be around pigs, all right? Nothing against the pigs. They have a job to perform in nature. It's just not their job to be providing uh, us for food. Again, God loves us. And the great creator has put in place good practices for our lives, both for maintaining health and for also the keeping of the Sabbath, both for rest and for the worship of our creator. Let us always remember the Sabbath. Let us always remember his righteous law. It is for our good. Thank you very much, and may all of you have a wonderful Sabbath. Very good. Thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate that. The Ramadan Dart Evangelistic Association presents Answers for the 21st Century Thinker.
law stating that it's now Leesville, Indiana. I'm standing in the neighborhood where I was raised in the 1950s. The left half of that duplex is my childhood home. My family lived here until I was a teenager, and it was in this neighborhood where my, my buddies and I roamed freely. We played kick the can right here in the middle of the street. On many summer nights, we played outside long into the darkness. We camped out in tents in our backyards, and the backyards were unfenced and unprotected. We walked many blocks to the city swimming pool. We biked eight miles north to where the beach was in Lake Michigan. Yes, we were free-range children, and yes, that was another time and another era. Now, should parents today allow their children to do the same things today that we did in the 1950s? I don't know the answer to that. It's the job of parents to answer this question. I can't tell you how to raise your kids. Instead, on Answers for the 21st Century Thinker, it's our job to simply teach things from the Bible, and let's see what the Bible tells us about how kids in the future are going to live when they play in the city. Zechariah chapter 8, 5 tells us about the future of the city of Jerusalem. And it says this, it says, the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. And what about the future of kids who live in the country? You know, today, sometimes a child playing in the country can be in more danger than a, a, a kid in the city. Not because of dangerous people, but because of dangerous animals. Where I live in Texas, parents have to be real careful with their kids because of coral snakes, rattlers, and copperheads. Well, in Isaiah 11:8, it says the following about kids in the future who are going to live in the country. It says, the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. Yes, there will be a time when children will be safe even from poisonous snakes. And when is this going to happen? Will it happen tomorrow, next week, next month, next year? Well, we don't know for sure exactly when, but we do know that this is the way that the world will be after Jesus returns to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be peace all over the earth. Nations will be peaceful. Individual citizens will be peaceful. And the animals will be peaceful. It's going to be a wonderful time for all of humanity. At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have an interesting study called To Know the Truth. It talks about how we can get back to real peace among people. It's on our website, rldea.com. It's free. Why don't you check it out? And we'll see you next time on Answers for the 21st Century Thinker at rldea.com. Answers for the 21st Century Thinker is a production of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. For more information, please visit our website, rldea.com. As you, uh, and for those of you who would like to uh, know of, uh, let, let's see, what was I going to, oh, I need to back up here a, bit, a little bit. Um, as always, uh, we do not ask you for money on this show. We don't want your money. If you send this money, we send it back. But we do ask for your prayers, and we asked earlier if you would pray about our technical solution that we're working on that we think is really going to improve the quality of the technical of the show. So please pray about that. We, we are very unashamed in our asking you for prayers. So please pray for this show on all levels, the spiritual level, uh, the interaction level with you, uh, the love for each other, and for the technical stuff. But the second thing uh, we ask for is that you please hit the share button. If you get value out of this show, please hit the share button. Or if you don't watch it on uh, Facebook, you watch it on YouTube, uh, copy the link and send it out to people in emails. Also, we know that some of you have asked, and I'm going to say this again, uh, you've asked, are there any worthy causes that we can donate to? And we have an answer. Yes, we re recommend that you consider two groups. And Nancy and I personally support these two groups. The first is Church of God Seventh Day in Tyler, Texas. And, oh, I need to put the uh, address up on the screen. And also the Tabitha Outreach Foundation. Nancy and I 
personally know the people who spend the money for these organizations, and we feel that we can vouch for their honesty, for their integrity and sincerity when it comes to doing God's work. Uh, again, Nancy and I don't get any money for uh, any kickbacks or anything, no finder's fee. If you send money to these, we don't get any of it. Our only involvement in these two groups is that we uh, ourselves donate to both these causes because we believe that the people running these two nonprofit groups are doing uh, genuine Christian works. And again, the addresses are uh, Church of God Seventh Day, 12513 Chapman Road, Tyler, Texas. 75708, and the other is the Tabitha Foundation. Um, we haven't talked about them recently. Nancy, uh, after I read the address, would you please uh, give a couple sentences about what the Tabitha Outreach Foundation is doing? It's run by our good friend Diane Webb and her husband. Uh, um, he's a uh, Vietnam vet. He's disabled. Uh, he was in a tank. Uh, his name is Mike Webb. Um, he's blind. And he's uh, disabled because of his war service uh, to the country. Anyway, Diane, uh, you can uh, send your contributions to Tabitha Outreach Foundation, care of Ty uh, Diane Webb. The address is 398 County Road 1597, Avenger, Texas 75630. Nancy, tell us uh, what they do uh, at the Tabitha Foundation. Um, they do a variety of things in support of um, people in Kenya. So uh, orphans and uh, widows. And some of the things they do is provide clothing, warm clothing in the winter for the orphans, um, or school clothing. Uh, they provide uh, um, like sewing a sewing machine, machine to the yep. widows so mm -hmm. that they can earn an income. Yeah, they, they make things with the mm -hmm. sewing machine so that they don't have to ask for charity. They don't have so, to ask for alms. So they're bettering their lives bettering and helping lives. them survive. And that, you know, in this country, we have uh, there we still have poor people. So I'm not saying the system is perfect, but we do have a system of uh, of things for uh, to help people who are widows. We've got Social Security. There mm -hmm. are a lot of churches that provide. And in Africa, there's just not as much of, no. of that available. And a lot of people even, um, you know, are barely on subsistence living. They, they right. still do a lot of growing by, you know, digging in the dirt with hand tools and That's stuff right. like and that. That's right, and having to carry buckets and buckets of water That's every right. day. Mm -hmm. they got to go down to some common well or a common spigot and a big part of their day is spent lugging water to mm -hmm. their homes. Mm -hmm. It could be a block, two blocks, could be a couple miles away from yeah. their house. Again, that's Church God Seventh Day and the Tabitha Outreach Foundation. If you are uh, in need of someone to uh, share your blessings with, we recommend them. We donate to them. And again, um, don't send money to us. We don't want your money. Uh, we'd rather you send it to them. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we go to the chat room now? Uh, yeah, yeah, we got to go to the chat room. And before we do, i got to say something. Okay. We're, we're back to technical problems. I am so sorry if we miss a comment from you. Nancy and I are supposed to be doing this together. But on, on this iPad that I just bought, brand new iPad, I can't see all the comments. I can only see a little block of them, and I can't go any further. We'll look at it another okay. time. All this great technology, we buy these great gadgets, and I can't always make them work. So we're going to have to rely on Nancy to tell us what's in the chat room. If we miss your comment, I apologize. Okay, so first of all, I want to say that Elizabeth uh, Waltzman was asking for prayers for her son, Lucas, who's having difficult uh, emotional troubles right now. Lucas's last name is what? Uh, I don't know. Her name is Elizabeth Waltman. Her son's name is Lucas. Well, so I assume it's Waltman. Let's assume it's Lucas Walton. Okay. Waltman. Walt Munn. Um, so I uh, just wanted to make a quick comment about Bill saying pig parts are uh, amazingly similar to human parts. You know, you remember that they talked <laughs> about putting a pig part in a human, pig heart. Oh, yeah. Um, I used to know a guy in uh, Church God International. Uh, what was his name? He was a pastor in Denton, Texas years mm -hmm. ago in the 80s. And um, he um, had a pig heart or pig valve mm -hmm. in his heart. Mm -hmm. Because the, the pig was the closest animal that they could find to come up with a valve. They would have rather taken it from a cow. Mm -hmm. They'd have rather taken it from a sheep. But it doesn't work as good as a pig. The pig stuff is really, really good to use in human bodies because they're so similar to us. Okay. Um, so Austin Newell. I just uh, remember Austin his name. Newell. Okay, Austin good. Newell. Some of you old timers might remember him from the old days of CGI. Okay, I'm sorry. So I wanted to mention something. Our good, our good friend Dennis Steele is um, giving his point of view in the chat. 
very friendly, you know, I'm, I'm not accusing him of anything, but uh, he's openly an atheist. Yes. And I wanted to mention that an atheistic member of my family asked me to do the Nazca line yes. from a Christian point of view. He wanted to know what a Christian would say about that. <clears throat> and um, he doesn't personally believe in aliens, but he, he wanted to know, you know, why what we would say about it. So that's why I took on the subject and why I brought it up. But I wanted to mention... Um, SOS is always going to be from a Christian point of view. I mean, that's the whole purpose of it. Yeah. So whether we take on news or, or you know, uh, examples or rules for living or whatever we take on, it's always going to be from the Christian perspective. So, um, and actually from a Christian Sabbath keeping perspective as well. So if you have a different perspective, we're, we'd love to hear it. Uh, from you, and if there's anything you are interested in that you would like yeah. to hear a Christian perspective on, we'd be more than happy to take it on. Won't always be me, might be Bill or Wes, but uh, one of us would be, be happy to deal with subject matters that you're interested in. And we welcome Bill, uh, uh, we welcome Dennis Deal into the chat room. Uh, let me give you a little history of uh, Dennis. He used to be a worldwide pastor, and uh, he pastored churches all over the United States. He has had I don't know, thousands and thousands of uh, parishioners over the years. And in the big breakup of Worldwide, he left and became an atheist. And I've known Dennis for years and years. We go all the way back to Chicago when I first got baptized. And I think he was a ministerial trainee back then. Or maybe he had just been ordained as local elder. So anyway, Dennis and I go way back. He and I communicate a lot, uh, you know, once a week, once every two weeks. I don't want to, uh, you know, overstate the situation, but uh, he and I have gotten really close lately. And all of you in the chat room, even though we disagree with Dennis on some things, I hope that you'll still show Dennis Christian love. Because uh, one of the things Dennis didn't like in Worldwide was anybody who disagreed with him, he got in trouble for it. And in the old church, we could get in trouble for not agreeing. In SOS, we are not homogenous. We don't all have the same views. Mm -hmm. And anybody that comes into our chat room that doesn't agree with us, we're happy to have them. We love to listen to them. We love them no matter what they believe in. And as long as everybody's nice to each other, we're all going to be happy. So I we hope you all. You. We hope that y'all you will all welcome Dennis Deal to the uh, chat room. And it's, we don't call him Dennis Deal because he's a a car dealer in Vegas. <laughs> it's, it's a different deal. D E I. HL, I believe Okay, I'm it is. glad you tried that. Uh, okay. So I wanted to point out also, in addition to uh, there being Christians and non-Christians in the chat room, mm -hmm. uh, Bill points out that uh, the audience is not just Church of God or, or former Church Excellent. of God. There's SDAs, other yes. Sabbatarians like Messianic, Seventh-day Baptist. <coughs> yes. So there's a lot. And in Bill's group, Bill who points this out, his group are not all Seventh-day Sabbath keepers, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and, and, and as a result of Bill's group, is 23,000 people. He brings a lot of them to SOS. We in our audience have atheists. We have people who believe in God. We have Sunday keepers. We have Sabbath keepers. And of the Sabbath keepers, uh, as Bill says, Seventh-day Adventists. We have Church of God Seventh-day. We got every flavor. We've got every flavor of everybody, and we love it that right. way. I, okay, I prefer... <laughs> I gotta be careful how I say this. I don't want to be with a bunch of people who are just like me, if because if if two people are exactly alike in their thinking, one of them is redundant and can be done away with. That's right. So I welcome all kinds of diversity of thought, and I welcome diversity of race uh, and ethnicity, and so. We are not homogenous on SOS. We've got it all. And I know that a lot of people who used to watch the show say, I don't like that because I only, I only want to be with people who are just like me. And I'm sorry they feel that way because I think they're missing out on a great opportunity. Sure, sure. So anyway, we welcome everybody to SOS, even those who disagree with us. Okay, so Deborah Wilson has a question for you over here on YouTube. Okay. Speaking of the flood, will anyone talk about how some people say that the entire world wasn't flooded and that there were people that didn't die and <clears throat> they were giants? I believe this is a myth. I, I personally don't believe that. I believe... That, you, that, don't, you, you don't believe it's true. So you're I, with I, Debbie. You don't think it's I'm true. with Debbie. I don't believe that anybody survived other than the eight who were on the ark. And um, I, I, I believe that it covered the whole earth. 
Now someone says, well, how could you get enough water to cover what's our highest mountain in the world? The Himalayas or Mount McKinley or something. How could you have enough? I don't think Everest, those, maybe. Everest, whatever. I don't think those. Christians out there who don't agree with us when we say it was a worldwide event there are Christians many many Christians who do not believe it was a worldwide event okay thank you for that Debbie good point point. and Carl posted a link to your sermon on Noah's Ark oh so. thank you okay yeah appreciate that Carl Carl, man, he's he's just always there you know he's, he's, right <laughs> top he's, very, he's very very helpful yes and so um, the the show has been interrupting and going fuzzy and stuff last uh, throughout the night. So we appreciate the folks still watching on YouTube and Facebook uh, because this is a great part of the show when we start having um, discussions about these kinds of things. So um, would you like to look at the comments on my iPad so you can read them? Sure, why not? Okay, pass me your iPad. And remember, my iPad, I'm logged in as you, so it's all what you would have seen here. Okay. Richard Maxwell says, SDA in the house. <laughs> Richard Maxwell is one of our Seventh-day Adventists. Right. Uh, Amy Hohart says, SOS is like Baskin, the, it, it is the Baskin Robbins of groups. Boy, we sure are. Excellent point, uh, uh, Amy. You go to Baskin Robbins and they're known as what, 31 flavors or something? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got at least 31 flavors out there. Uh, Mimi Hohort says, uh, uh, Mimi, <laughs> Mimi Zerke says, praise God for each and every one of you who are with us. And, and that is so true because Nancy and I don't just love people who are like us or who believe like us or look like us or act like us. We love everybody and we want to welcome everybody into our friendship. So thank you. And Marion Marion Young Perkins says uh, everyone has an opinion and each understand on a different level. We just need to love all. And you know, <clears throat> different people like to study and focus on different things. So yeah. for example, right now I'm doing a study in Proverbs, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, maybe at the end of it I'll mm -hmm. have more thoughts and insight into Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're studying something else and you've got greater thoughts and insights there. When we're here together and we can have open dialogue. You can teach me, I can teach yes. you, we can learn from each other, learn we can talk about other. the world. There's even a scripture that says people spoke to each other every day and it was a, um, and God took notice and blessed them. No. I think it's like in Malachi. Mm. Okay, maybe so. Somebody can look that up and throw it up. Uh, I want to embarrass uh, my uh, Church God Seventh-day Pastor, Ariel Melkor, is watching. Hello, Ariel. Uh, Ariel is uh, a wonderful pastor that we have in Church God Seventh-day when we attend over there. He plays guitar. He and I are in a group. And we have uh, another guy who plays bass. His name is Juan. And we have uh, girl singers, uh, Ariana, Anna, and um, Aneri. And Angie. And Angie, yeah, I've got, okay. Yeah, you miss one of those girls, you're going to get a black yeah, eye Yeah, I'm going to get a black eye in church tomorrow. Um, and uh, is, uh, is Ariel giving the sermon tomorrow? Uh, I don't know. Ariel, talk to us in the we're, chat room. We're going to be there tomorrow, we're Ariel. There. I understand that there are some, uh, I'll bring cookies, so tell the kids yeah. to give me cookies. And I understand, uh, what what were they making that were? Tamales. Tamales. We're, we're picking up tamales. tamales. They're having a fundraiser. Okay. And uh, we'll be there, not for the morning service, but for the afternoon service, because I'm old. Uh, Blake Silverstein says, uh, hello, glad uh, you are here. Uh, or, or, um, he's, uh, or no, Bill said to Blake, hi, Blake Silverstone, glad you're here. I'm going to embarrass poor Blake Silverstein, not Silverstone. Um, and uh, he's the uh, like executor, executive director of Christian Educational Ministries. Uh, I like to get together with Blake sometime, uh, talk to him. Okay. So, um, so uh, Marge Colson Pope says she's uh, she's from Like Minds and old friends with Linda Hardy White. Really, Marge? I remember, uh, Mar I wasn't on Like Minds as much as Linda. Linda lived and died 
uh, like mine. She loved it, but I do remember Marge on there now that she said that. Hi, Marge. After all these years, it's nice to see you. Okay, I got another question for you from Al Bundy okay. 59 What do you teach or believe about the gap theory, that there was a time gap of billions of years between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2? I don't believe in the gap theory myself. So, um... Al Bundy wants to know about your belief in the gap theory. Okay, that's Al Bundy, right? Uh -huh. Al Bundy 59. 59. Um, disfellowship him from this chat room because I disagree. No, <laughs> and just, mark him. Just, just kidding, Al. Yeah, I believe in the gap theory. I believe there's a whole bunch of time between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. That's my personal opinion. But again, Al, um, you don't believe that? That's fine, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think we've talked about No, it wasn't, it wasn't here we talked about it. I think we talked about it on bots. We went into a uh, discussion on okay. Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2 okay. and all that. But anyway. Um, you can probably find it if you look at the CGI website. Yeah. Um, so uh, Carl helped us out. Malachi 3 16. At least I had the book right. Um, they, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Carl. Rod Kuzman says, because the Seventh-day Adventists do not send their children to schools where they teach evolution. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, Trudy Cranford says, blurry and sound problems. Yeah, blur we got a blurry. Please keep praying. No, blurry we comes and goes, and it's related to our internet service. Yeah, and um, uh, we keep praying for us because we hope we've gotten, we do have a solution in the works, and, and we're just waiting for a final okay and we won't give you the, the uh, details on that. You were very excited about it. Yeah, we were very excited. We're, we're praising God that he's given us this opportunity. We hope he opens the door. Rod Kuzman brings up an excellent point. He said, there are more Seventh-day Adventists than there are Church of God. Now, that is absolutely yep. true. If you add up all the people in the Church of God Seventh-day, of which there are several, there's a, you know, the main just in evidence, Denver, but, there's but proof a group in that there actually Idaho, was a Paul, census Idaho, in Judea Jerusalem, at the very yeah, time all of, all that Jesus was born. People, From 1947 all the Armstrong up, churches and all the millions of offshoots, and you take that total and compare it to the Seventh Day Adventists, there's a whole lot more Seventh Day Adventists than there are Church of God. And maybe sometime we can do a study on the history of Church of God Seventh Day, which Armstrong came out of. Church God Seventh Day and the Seventh Day Adventists because they were once together. Mm -hmm. And there are those who claim the Church of God came out of uh, church uh, out of Seventh Day Adventists. Well, that's not quite true. It was in the uh, 1860s when they were, the people were working together, but some of them said, we are not gonna be part of uh, the SDAs and they did their own thing and they did not look at it as they came out of it. They just looked at it that they split and went their own separate ways. So that's just a, a little historical footnote. But but uh, Ron is absolutely correct. There are more SDAs than there are COGs. Okay. Uh, B. Sisson, uh, Abraham says disobedience brought separation between God and man. It causes Satan, uh, causes by uh, sin by Satan. Or anyway, Satan is awkward sentence. Satan the devil, sin. Uh, he's a deceiver, a death, and a killer. So. Okay. Richard Maxwell says pork has worms in it. I think they're trigonosis worms, aren't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. They're kind of little microscopic things. Um, and, the, and he says, now, I, I, I'm sure Richard is correct. I, I can't uh, back this up. He said, USDA approves pork as long as it has less uh, 26 or less worms per pound for human consumption. Okay, so one worm is too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> but people do love their bacon. I noticed on Bill's thing he had... You know, but I love bacon, uh, and he didn't mean himself. A lot of people say that. I mean, I know I've got family members uh, not in the same church as me who are just obsessed with bacon. But still, turkey bacon's a whole lot better than pork bacon because pork bacon is mostly fat, and mm -hmm. I used to love pork bacon. Mm -hmm. But even then, I pref before I got into clean and unclean, I preferred the turkey because mm -hmm. I didn't like eating all that fat. Just mm -hmm. like on a pork chop, I didn't want to eat the fat around the edges of the pork chop. I don't want to eat that nasty fat. And pork bacon is just mostly fat, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't get it. You know, forget the Bible, just who wants to eat that, you know? Oh, Larry Evans talks about the late Jim Ross. Um, uh, I knew Jim, he was a great guy. He gave a seminar at the CEM feast on the six days of creation were not literal 24-hour days, but eras 
of an unknown duration. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I'm a little surprised that um, that would have been done at CEM. This is the first I'd heard of it. And CEM, for those of you who don't know, it's Christian Educational Ministries. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you, Larry. The late Jim Ross. Um, I may, hey, Blake, maybe you can uh, find that and uh, send me a link to that seminar, if you wouldn't mind. I'd like, like to see what Jim came up with. Okay, so there's an interesting uh, debate between Richard Maxwell, who is SDA, and uh, Dennis Deal mm -hmm. about uh, were people vegetarian before the flood. Mm -hmm. So Richard says people were made vegetarian after the flood. We started eating mm -hmm. flesh. Dennis says we've got canine teeth, so we were made for you know made for eating meat and tearing meat. Um, so we just had if we were made, meant to be vegan. Uh, we just have crushing teeth like a cow or an elephant. I got to point out, there's a difference between vegetarian and vegan. Big difference. But uh, so let's not use them interchangeably. Na and them. Nancy knows all about vegetarian versus vegan. Her and her daughter Reagan are constantly having these conversations about vegetarian and vegan. And I just sit there, Ugh, and I don't, I don't learn anything. I find it so. Boring. I just don't yeah. pay attention. So, I should know all about this. But so neither one of us are vegan. No. But uh, we do know know all about it. And when you say neither one of us, you mean you and Reagan, yes, your daughter. Yes. Okay. You but not are me. a carnivore. I am a total carnivore, and you can see by my my carnivore teeth. I keep am them a sharp. And I, I keep them I am a meat eater. He loves. Well, anyway, we'll let those two work that out because I don't have the answer about yeah. Um, what happened um, before before the flood or yeah. before the fall? Uh, well, he mentions before the flood at first, and then before sin entered the world, there was no death. Entered the world, there was no death. So I I found it to be an interesting discussion. Yeah. And I didn't bring it up because I want to say one is right or wrong, but I never thought about it in terms of that. Did they just eat fruits and nuts and seeds and, yeah. and uh, vegetables in the garden before uh, sin entered? Yeah. I've always been under the impression, and and let me tell you something, what I'm about to say, it's going to be worth every dime that you pay for what you're about to hear. And how much are you paying for it? Nothing. So that's what it's worth. Okay. I was under the impression that Adam and Eve were basically were uh, uh, vegetarians um, before the fall. And, that, and that's why when God sacrificed the lamb after their sin, that was a very traumatic event. They, I don't. I get the impression, and I could, what do I know? We, we, there's nothing in the Bible. I get the impression that they had never seen an animal killed before. Mm -hmm. And here they see God kill this animal and then take the skins and process them, whatever requires that's required to do to, pro, to make clothes mm -hmm. for them. And so that was a real learning experience for him because it was a type of Christ that he had to sacrifice his shed blood for our our sins you know of all eternity so my impression was rightly or wrongly was that we were vegetarians before the fall but and i've heard people talk about that we were vegetarians before the flood but i i just can't believe that uh, i can't did find you sacrifice those animals and didn't do anything with them yeah because we we have uh, cain and abel do uh you know doing our Abel doing a, an animal sacrifice mm -hmm. after the fall, that tells me that Abel was not a, a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And maybe he was just doing this to appease God, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't eat it. He just did. I, the point is, we don't know. I don't think we know. I, I certainly don't know. Well, um, so in, in that uh, theory of how things went, that there was no death, even animal death, before the fall. And we don't know how long the time was between... Right. Uh, creation and uh, Eve eating the apple, or whatever it was, not apple. It wasn't. Was. We don't know it was an apple. Yeah, yet. we know. We don't know what it was. It's yeah. just you. You say apple because you said computer. You know, apple computer. An apple joke. Yeah. So uh, that made me think of it. So whatever this uh, fruit was or, or thing that was that they ate, uh, so that would mean that would have to mean that the animals were vegetarian back then too, just like the Bible talks about in the kingdom. That the lion will eat straw. Like Bill says ox. that. Lions yeah. will be vegetarian in the kingdom of God, even though they've got these teeth. Uh, Amy Hohert says, Wesley, you and my cat ought to meet up for dinner sometime. <laughs> what does that mean? Because uh, you're carnivores. Oh, we're both carnivores. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. all right. Wes is, Wes is not a cat people. He's yeah. not a cat person. Yeah. He's not a dog person either, so... <laughs> 
No, I like animals. You know, this is so cool. I wish I wish my laptop would do what Nancy's is doing. I don't know if you can see this. I can see every comment that you guys have made all night. Is yours doing it now? It's the, yours is doing it now. How yeah. did you get it to do that? Uh, we'll talk about it okay, later. Okay, we'll talk about you. You always say that, but we never do. <laughs> we do, Rod. We do. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What else? Abel sacrificed the best of his flock. Lee Listman. Good point, Lee. Thank you. Lee, I got to ask you. And I hope you don't mind me embarrassing you. Are you related to the the late Van Lisman? Um, Lisman's not a common name, and I just wondered if maybe you were. I believe Van Lisman was uh, on the board of directors of uh, Ambassador College when I was a student. board of directors of uh, Ambassador College when I was a student. Branson at the feast in 1984. You know, I think I was there. Who was that? Larry who? Uh, Larry Evans. Larry Evans. I believe I was there too. And, uh, and and I think we met at the Roy Clark Theater in Branson. Okay. We're oh, okay. No, that's, that's boring everybody, so. Well, I don't know. Uh, what else? Um, Trying to back up a little bit. Richard Maxwell comments. talks about... At, uh, before the flood, there were rolling hills. We can bring her on before the days of unleavened bread so that she can give some recipes about unleavened bread. Or she can get up and talk about child rearing since she has successfully raised three children who are now adults. But she better not quote a scripture. <laughs> and that's seriously, that's what a lot of people wish Nancy were doing instead of what she's doing. Okay. So Richard Maxwell, going back to uh, my presentation about the Nazca lines and aliens and things like that, uh, Richard says, the Bible says God created other worlds with life on them. They, they are not fallen worlds as our world is, and no, they haven't visited us in spaceships. So several people have asked for scriptures. Richard, I'd love to hear your scripture back up for that as well. Uh, you can write Wes at... Uh, wdwhite49 at yahoo.com and send us whatever scriptures you've got on that. It should be interesting. I'd love to see it. Yeah, and I, I'm really familiar with the names of the people that are in the chat room. Uh, and when so, one is not familiar, um, uh, sometimes I want to ask about it. Here's somebody from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. His last name is Abraham. His first name is spelled O-B-I-S-E-S-A-M. Let me see if I can say that. Obesesan. So, Obesesan Abraham, we thank you for being here with us tonight. I think you're a newbie. I saw some other uh, newbies in here. Okay, well, you look for those. Uh, Bob Petty says, at the speed of light, the nearest star is four years away. Yeah. Well, that's not long. <laughs> that's that's at, at, um, uh, at the speed of light, if we could go the speed of warp light. Ten, warp one. Oh. But if we could go warp two, we'd get there you know, fast. Warp years. three. If we could warp, warp four, you could get there in a year. Exactly. That's my whole point. If you watch Star Trek, you know we... We can conceivably get up to, they can, they can go like warp eight, warp, a little over warp nine sometimes, but it tears the engine apart. And it depends and, on which show you watch too, like the older one. Yeah, you... right. And, and if you're going over warp nine, the shields really can't hold and the, <laughs> the, the port in the cell, you know, really starts shaking real bad. Okay. But... So now you're showing what you spend your time on. Okay. Anyway. Um, all right. So, uh, so when we away... say speed of light, we mean warp one. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. And he, he further says, until we're born again as Christian, as children of God, with eternal life, we won't be able to travel the cosmos. <clears throat> okay. All right. I think that's all I can find. Man, this is so cool. Look at all the comments here. 
Where Sobermite says, distances to other galaxies or even just over other suns with planets isolates us from other human type beings from reaching us unless they were superhumans with tremendous long lifespans. Yeah. So, like I said, possible, not probable in my opinion, but that they came and helped the Nazca people. Not, not that they could be there. That's an entirely different question. Yeah, I think if we knew the truth about the uh, Nephilim, mm -hmm. the pre-flood giants, I think we'd be amazed at what they were and what they could do. I think they were more than just big people. But again, the scriptures don't tell us, hey, Mimi's telling us about how she's loving the new place and the quietness. Good for you. Okay. All right. Willow Love Al, we're happy you're here too. Um, and uh, we love you as well. So right. probably we, we have gone an hour and a half. Yeah, we need to go. You said right. it would be a short show tonight. <laughs> I, I lied. Okay. So come back next, uh, next Friday night at 8 o'clock. And we'll be here. And we're going to talk about judging. And um, I'm going to spend a lot of time on uh, judging uh, next week. I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of history. Uh, and some of you say, I don't like history. I just want to study the Bible. Or they say, this show should just be a Bible study. No, it's not a Bible study. We study the Bible in, in this show, but it's a show. We talk about current events. We talk about Christian living. We talk about um, our inner reactions with each other, how we can love each other, how we can love people outside the church, love our neighbor who lives right next door to us, even though he's a raging alcoholic. we got to love everybody, and uh, that's what we talk about on this show. So come back next Friday night, 8 o'clock Central, start our Sabbath, and we're going to continue talking about judging. I have no idea what Bill is going to talk about. Bill, I'll bet, doesn't either because Terry hasn't told him yet. Oh, no. But anyway, let's close with prayer. And, but I won't be here, so I don't have to give a subject. Okay. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to be with each other. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to welcome all people into our chat room. We thank you for the love that we have that we can share with these people, even those who don't think like us. Father, everyone on the face of the earth is your child. Every one of them is very special to you. And since they're special to you, they're special to us. Help us to always keep that in mind for all people who walk the face of the earth. Father, we are so grateful that we have this opportunity at the beginning of your seventh day of rest to do all these things, talk to each other, study your word, learn about each other, uh, be concerned about each other, pray for each other. Now, Father, those who are going to be traveling to church tomorrow, we ask that you please give them safety in everything that they do. When they get to church, please help them to have a wonderful Sabbath day. Help them to have love for one, any, uh, one another. Father, again, we are so grateful to you for you and your creation, your son who sits at your right hand. We thank you that you put the Holy Spirit in us. Father, we have so much to be grateful for, and we thank you for all these things. We dedicate our lives to you always, and we do it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll see you next uh, Friday night. And in the meantime, have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Hi, Wesley Davidson. He said hi. hi to us. Oh, hi, Wesley. Nice to see you again. Did I, Wesley, did I ever send you the picture of me holding you as a baby? Let me know. I, I can send it to you as a Facebook um, attachment. Okay. And so I, he should I, write you. He knows how to reach me in the um, uh, Facebook uh, thing. Um, yeah, and anyway, you're, you're like this big, and I'm a, I think I'm a punky 19-year-old uh, kid with long hair. Oh, wait, that's me now. And, and I uh, had kind of, a, I needed a shave that day. So uh, let me know if you want that picture. I'm gone? No. Oh, okay. Nancy says, shut up. Shut up. We got to close down. Okay. See you next week.